Joanna Cherry, obviously you are watching very keenly what's happening at the SNP conference this week. In advance of it, you suggested that the party could no longer just keep saying, up with this, we will not put. So what would you like to hear instead? Well, in fairness, the party is no longer saying that. And we're, we're meeting at a very exciting time for the SNP. It's the first time we've met in person for three years. First time since our third general election victory in, our, in a row. First time since our fourth Scottish election victory in a row. Uh, independence is riding high in the opinion polls. Social attitude survey shows support at uh, 52%. Uh, the tanking of the British economy by the Tories has destroyed the argument which Alistair ran in the last referendum about the broad shoulders of the UK and Scotland being better off in the UK than out with it. And the energy crisis shows the failures of the British government to invest in the incredible renewable so resources what do you we want have to in hear Scotland. from the First Minister this morning? Because you have, from time to time, been keener to hear of more urgency, haven't you? Well, the First Minister has announced a plan which I suggested several years ago, which is to test the legality of uh, whether or not the Scottish Parliament uh, can hold an, an independence referendum in the Supreme Court next week. And I'm very much looking forward to going to court and hearing uh, the arguments. And I've, I've enjoyed reading the written arguments both on behalf of the Lord Advocate and behalf of the Scottish National Party, which stress uh, the right of self-determination mm -hmm in international law. So the First Minister has announced that and I'm completely in agreement with her that until such times mm -hmm. as we see what the judgment of the Supreme Court is, uh, there's no need to flesh out the, the later start, the later parts of her strategy. We need to wait and see what the Supreme Court says. But okay. you see, really, we need to take well, this back well, to basics because this isn't really an issue of law. This is an issue of politics and constitutionality. Okay. There's a majority in the Scottish mm -hmm. Parliament in favour of a second independence referendum. The last time that happened, the British government came to the negotiating table and agreed that there could be a referendum. That is the custom and practice of the British well, Constitution. Well, let's see what the First Minister's got to say. You guys are with us throughout the programme, so we'll be back to you a little <coughs> later on. Now, Nicola Sturgeon is probably the most successful politician of her generation. Certainly the last one standing after several Prime Ministers <laughs> have come and gone during her time in office. But that dream of an independent Scotland still eludes her. Could the country reach another junction soon? Well, here she is. First Minister, <laughs> woman good morning. Not perhaps the best <laughs> intro I've ever had, Laura. Well, let, 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 let's, let's see then. You are, you are here. We're glad that you're here this morning. You have promised to the country, and under your plan, Scotland is mm. due to have a referendum in a year and ten days' mm. time. Are you confident that will happen? Uh, yes, I am confident that uh, that can happen. Um, as Joanna Cherry's just been outlining, the Supreme Court next week will consider the question of does the Scottish Parliament have the competence to legislate for that referendum? There's little point speculating on the outcome mm -hmm. of a, a court uh, hearing. But should the answer to that be yes, we have the plans ready to go to legislate uh, the uh, work on refreshing and updating the substantive case for independence mm -hmm. is well underway. In fact, mm -hmm. that will continue over the course of mm -hmm. the next days. Um, so, you know, let's, as Joanna just said, wait and see what the court says. And but you, but I'm it, confident Scotland is going to become independent. But if you have that vote, what's to stop the UK government saying, well, we're not going to take part, we're not going to participate? Look, I, I cannot sit here and... Uh, predicate everything I do on uh, the, the basis that a UK government will continue to act in a deeply anti-democratic fashion. I've got to do what I consider to be the right thing, which is firstly respecting the will of the Scottish people, which remember is for an independence referendum. I was elected last year as First Minister on a record share of the vote, on a record turnout, on a very clear manifesto commitment to a referendum. But just so, on that practical point, and I know why you want to have it and you believe you've got the right to have well, that, but think, on that practical point, mm -hmm. you can't stop the UK saying, we're not taking I part. don't think, if, if the Supreme Court paves the way for a lawful referendum next year, I, I think the vast majority of the people of Scotland would take part in that. Mm. And, you know, the UK government might decide to say they don't want them to take part in that, mm. but I don't think that is going to prevail. And I, but, apart from anything else, I think the overwhelming impression that that gives, which I think the UK government is already giving by their refusal to countenance democracy, is that they don't believe they can win the substantive case. If, if you are confident in your arguments in politics, if you are confident in the case that you are making, then you don't fear democracy. Mm. You actually relish the opportunity to put your case before the people and let the people decide. Well, let's talk about where the arguments are then, and I think we can show you and also the audience where support for independence has mm. been. So if we look there, this graph goes all the way back to July 2016, and essentially it's 50-50. It's been 50-50 mm. for a long time, bouncing up and down a bit. But there's another question that people are asked about whether or not they want the choice 
now or would they like the choice in a few years and if we can look at that then it paints really quite a different picture and I think if we can bring this up essentially support for having a referendum now is far far lower look at this here when do you want another Scottish referendum again people have been asked over time in the next 12 months that's often less than 30 percent so do you really feel that the public want to have this now well, let, let because make, the polls suggest something very different let me make two points in, in response to that it's a fair question firstly you know opinion polls are important you know no politician who says opinion polls are not important is is credible because we all love poring over opinion polls but on mm. this question of is there a mandate for an independence referendum we don't actually have to look at opinion polls because mm -hmm. that election result that i talked about last year yeah. The SNP won the election on a very clear manifesto commitment. Now, usually political parties get criticised for not sticking to and delivering their manifesto commitments. I'm getting criticised in this context for trying to deliver on that commitment. But secondly, and this is the substantive point, you know, we are seeing every day right now the issues you were speaking to the panel about, the consequences for Scotland of not being independent. You know, Alistair uh, in 2014 told the people of Scotland uh, with his colleagues that independence would threaten our membership of the European Union, independence would imperil people's pensions, independence would cause a currency crisis. Look where we are right now, out of the okay. European Union, pensions within hours but uh, first of minister, falling the, but the down, arguments and, for and against. the currency plunging. These are the consequences that people are paying the price of right now, and but these for, all flow for Scotland but, from not being an independent but, country. And, and that's your view, and you've made that very clear. But the question of the arguments for and against independence is a different one to whether there really is public clamour, public demand for a vote within the next year in 12 months, which is what, which is what you would like. And, and what, we've, what we've shown people this morning is there isn't a huge clamour to have a vote, and the arguments are pretty settled 50-50. Look, I fought an election on this manifesto commitment and won the election overwhelmingly. You know, I, I believe that there is an appetite for a referendum. The opinion polls on this question, even more than opinion polls on the headline uh, issue, uh, come and go and, and mm, ebb and flow. Around. But at the end of the day, I, I believe very firmly, and I think this is a, a, a bit of an iron law of politics, uh, if the other side of this debate really believed people in Scotland didn't want a referendum, and if they really believed that people in Scotland would vote against independence, they would be the ones clamouring for a, a referendum well, Maybe they right just now. don't want the disruption. Uh, they well, don't want people to go through well, it again. For goodness sake. I mean, disruption? I mean, perish the thought that we would have disruption in people's lives right now. The disruption that people are suffering right now are coming from decisions that have been imposed on Scotland against our will. From Brexit to the kind of decisions that we saw Liz Trust take just a couple of weeks ago. The and, impact and of that on people. Now, that is because, as a country, we don't have control over our and, own and destiny. That's, and that's your issue. view, and you take, make that no, very but clearly, but I'd like complete, to talk about what you, can what you do. Can I complete one point on this right briefly, now? Briefly, if you can, we, we've got so we much to talk about. We are here in Aberdeen mm -hmm. uh, for the last uh, five decades, the oil and gas capital of Europe, but Scotland is now uh, the, one of the, the renewable capitals of uh, Europe. We have massive renewable energy, and yet we are sitting here with people of Scotland facing and, soaring energy And we are going to talk about energy a bit later. And so, possible so power cuts. We're, and we're going to talk about energy a bit later on. That is a good example of how Westminster and, is not working And we're going to talk about energy a bit later on. But I want to stick about what you, what you do. Let's say the Supreme Court doesn't allow you to have this vote. Now, you've now said if there isn't a way of having a referendum, you would treat the next general election, the next UK general election, as if it were a referendum on independence. Now, to be exactly clear about what you mean there, what you're saying is that if more than half of the population voted for parties who back independence, you believe that would give you a mandate to make Scotland an independent country? That's what we would do if the Supreme Court say there is no way for a referendum. Can I say that? That is not my preference. It's not what I want to happen. But that's now your plan but, B. Well, look, we have to have an alternative. If, if democracy is blocked, if the, the route by which uh, it would be right to consider and decide this issue, which is a, a lawful constitutional referendum, is blocked by Westminster mm. because they fear the democratic choice of the people of Scotland, then for me and for the SNP and for people who support independence, the choice is then simple. We put our case to people in an election or we mm. give up on Scottish democracy. And, you know, I want to be very clear today, I will never, ever give up on Scottish democracy. But you used to say that doing anything other than having a legal, legitimate referendum was a unionist trap to use your yeah. words. And a few years ago, actually, at your party conference, people put forward the idea of using a general election. And you said, you said be, no, you said it was a trap. But it, but it should be a last resort. I don't want to be in that position. I want to have a, a lawful referendum. That's mm -hmm. 
Wh whether you support or oppose independence, and both of those views are valid, I'm very clearly on one side of that debate, but whatever your, your, your view is on independence, the way to decide it is in a democratic, lawful referendum. So we're only talking but not, about the not scenario. A general election. Well, because but, a general but, election but wouldn't general, guarantee you okay, independence, so, would it? But, but the, the thing is here, if a referendum is blocked, completely indefensibly blocked by a Westminster government, then what choice do, do we have? We, we say, well, the, the voice of Scotland doesn't matter, Scottish democracy doesn't matter, or we put our case to the people in but the that general also election. Wouldn't be, but let's wouldn't hope we're not a, in that position. But, but that also wouldn't give you a guarantee of it actually happening. And I mean, per, perhaps it's the case that actually your this... options, well, well, perhaps it's the case that your options in a way are, are sort of running out of road. You know, you promised a referendum in the 2016 election, it didn't happen. You promised a referendum in 2017, it didn't happen. You tried again in 2019, it didn't happen. It was promised again in 21 and it didn't happen. And now there's this potential plan B, if the court doesn't go your way, about using the next general election. Now, this isn't about saying whether it's a good idea or not a good idea. It's about whether or not you maybe admit that you just don't have the mechanism to make it happen. You just don't well, have you know, the if method. True, Laura, if, if that is true, if my options are, are limited, which, you know, obviously is the case to some extent, then yeah. that is because I am in, Scotland is in a system and we face a Westminster system that simply will not respect Scottish democracy, that will not look at an, an election result in Scotland, uh, electing a government on a manifesto commitment for a referendum and say, do you know what? We will argue against independence in that referendum, but it is right and proper that we respect the right of the people of Scotland to decide. So if, if our options are limited, it is because a Westminster system refuses Scottish democracy. And I have to say, that then is one of the most powerful arguments mm. for Scotland being an independent country. The UK is meant to be you know, a voluntary partnership uh, of nations. And if we have a position where Scotland is told that we're not even allowed the choice of becoming independent, mm -hmm. then it is no longer a voluntary partnership of nations. The whole basis of the United Kingdom falls apart. So that is a really powerful argument for being an independent country so that we do then have a partnership of equals mm -hmm. with the other nations Well, it's of going the to be UK. a fascinating few weeks yes, and months indeed. ahead with the court decision. Um, let's turn to energy, and we are, after all, in Aberdeen, capital of the UK oil and gas industry. Um, you've criticised the UK's plan to issue new oil and gas licenses and you've said they should be climate compatible there's a system of checking whether or not things um, tick all the right boxes but would you ever support issuing new oil and gas licenses I know it's up to Westminster at the moment but if you're independent so it'd be up said, to you would you approve them or not well I'll come directly to that question in a minute but let's just put this into context first of all the, the North Sea which has served Scotland well mm -hmm is you know, a mature basin, it's a declining resource, uh, even before we consider the environmental uh, imperative here. Yeah, but, but we but also, a, I'm, I'm coming a... on to but we also have the environmental imperative of having to move away from fossil fuels as quickly as possible. Well, people have and the Scotland is in the lucky... pay their bills and keep their lights on. Yeah, yeah but, but exactly. We're in the lucky position of mm -hmm. having this vast renewable potential. We've just given the go ahead to up to 28 gigawatts of offshore wind energy and, through and, the Scotland and first Mr. For, Forgive so me for pressing the... you, but time is short. This is a question of principle. Would you ever, can you see circumstances where you would approve licenses for new oil what and I've gas said exploration? Is, whether it's new licenses or existing licenses that are applying for development consent, there must be at every stage a robust climate compatibility But if there check. is, so you if, would, because Friends of the Earth have said there can be no climate compatible new oil and well, gas. So that, in a sense, is the point I'm coming on to. I am very sceptical as to whether new exploration can pass that test. But without seeing the, the climate comp compatibility assessments, I can't answer that question in the hypothetical. But I am sceptical in the context we are in right now, uh, if, that, if, if any of but that would pass But that's interesting, because clearly tests. then on principle, if they could, then you might, you wouldn't say well, no, we're, no, we're never. We're in a hypothetical situation. Okay. The problem right well, now is it, those climate compatibility yeah. checks are not being done uh -huh. uh, in the, the case of... But, but you're clearly like saying no, no, never, but you're, just, you're not sure uh, if they would be... And they're not doing, they're not uh, being done strongly enough in the case of okay. new licences. OK. Now, income tax is devolved in Scotland, mm. and there's a different tax system, with different tax rates. Um, but Liz Truss has just announced the 1p cut to the basic rate, 20p down to 19p. Well, she's announced it, whether it actually 
comes into being. Well, well that's a question for her in the government. You know. We might ask Nadeem Zahawi later on. But will you cut your tax rate to match that so that people pay less in Scotland? Well, we will set our budget in December and we will set out our tax plans as part of that. And we will come to that uh, decision in a, a balanced way, taking account of all of mm -hmm. the, the factors you would expect any government to. But can I, but point, out, can I point out right now, right now, mm -hmm. the majority of income taxpayers in Scotland already pay less income tax than the rest they, of the They do, the but UK. that's why I asked this question, because after the UK's changes, sure. all Scottish taxpayers will pay the same or more if you don't if, match if any put, of the tax cuts. And we'll take that decision in the course of our budget consideration, and we will My weigh up... about a million we, people in we Scotland who pay 20p. The, the need to ensure uh, that tax is fair and progressive. We already have a more progressive system, but we'll also weigh up the need to have proper investment in our public services, not least our National Health Service, which is having you know, significant challenges right now. What we will not do, uh, and uh, it's not that long ago, just a week or so ago, when Scottish Conservatives, yeah. commentators, mm -hmm. were demanding that we followed suit to abolish but the in, top rate term, of tax. We will not cut tax for the wealthiest at the expense but, but of everybody else that, and though, their public this services. This is about there are about a million people in Scotland who pay that rate, and what I'm hearing this morning is you, 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 you well, aren't you, ready to, to say well, whether but, or not they'll have, pay less. The they'll greatest, have a cut in the same with way the greatest that English respect, Laura, we have a well-established mm -hmm. budget process in Scotland. Oh, no, that's fine. I'm just asking so we you the question the and you don't want to answer it yet. And that's we fine. will take the decision based on a balanced consideration. This is a really difficult time for people. Mm -hmm. We are doing things to try to lift the incomes mm -hmm. of those at the lowest. We have a Scottish child that's payment why they might in quite Scotland. Like a tax cut. Oh, but, but we have a Scottish child payment in Scotland that nobody else in the UK has. £25 a week almost uh, soon for every child in low-income families. Uh, we don't pay for prescriptions in in Scotland, we have and, free and, tuition and there's lots of decisions you have to make in the your budget, and we'll, so we'll, 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 we'll look forward to it. Get good value for money, a better value for money than anywhere well, that's, else in that's, the UK. That's your view. We'll look forward to seeing your budget a bit fact, later in the, a, a bit later in the year. <laughs> Just briefly, we're, we're 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 running out of time, but um, is, let's trust a friend or a foe. We're political opponents, but I've always tried to work with her predecessors and I will try to work with her. So I would like to be a friend on the basis of uh, the areas where we can work together constructively. And what about Keir Starmer, friend or foe? I, I work very well with Keir Starmer over Brexit. I'm really disappointed that Keir Starmer um, has thrown in the towel on uh, the European Union and no longer wants to take the UK or Scotland back into the and European Union. who would you Union. rather have as Prime Minister? Well, that's not a difficult question. I mean, if the question to me is would I prefer a Labour government over a Tory government, I, I detest the Tories and everything they stand for, so it's not difficult to answer that question. Uh, so so yes, you, you want to see Keir Starmer you know, in the Two things, two things. Firstly, you know, being better than the Tories is not a high bar to cross right now. I think we need to see more of a radical alternative from Labour rather than just a pale imitation. And if you're asking me, do I think either a Westminster Tory government or a Westminster Labour government is good enough for Scotland, then my answer to that question is no. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, thank you thank so you. much for joining us here in Aberdeen this morning. Well, lots to get through from what Nicola Sturgeon has been saying to us. Um, Joanna Cherry, what did you make of what you heard? Does this general election as a referendum kind of stack up to you? Well, I mean, I, I agree with everything the First Minister has said. As I said earlier, it's some time now since I first advocated that we should test the legal case. Um, and uh, as I stressed earlier, <coughs> and as the First Minister stressed, there's a majority in the Scottish Parliament for a second referendum to be held. Even if we lose the Supreme Court case, that wouldn't stop the British government from coming to the negotiating table. And that's what they should do. What but makes you think what I'd, just like, I'd just like they... to say one thing. Um, a lot of people seem to have assumed in advance that we're going to lose. Um, I'm not a party to this litigation, but I've been involved in previous litigations, the prorogation case and the Article 50 revocation case, where everyone assumed we were going so to the Brexit, lose. The big, and we went on Brexit and, and, and we won in, in the Supreme Court and in the European Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. So I would caution people against assuming that we're going to lose the case. I think there's some, there's some very uh, strong arguments. But I'm in agreement with the First Minister that we shouldn't get... She, she doesn't need to flesh out her strategy on how she would use a general election as a, a plebiscite until we see the outcome of the Supreme Court case. But there has to be... There, there has to be a recognition of the mandate that the First Minister got in the last election. There has to be a recognition that the Scottish Parliament, the majority of MSPs in it, want to hold a second referendum. If we cannot do that, then we need some sort of democratic event to demonstrate that the balance of, of opinion in Scotland has uh, changed. 
uh, since uh, 2014. So I'm, I'm with the First Minister on this strategy. I mean, it, it's often, it's often, I'm often portrayed as somebody who disagrees with Nicola Sturgeon, but that's not the case. I mean, we have a big disagreement in the area of women's rights and lesbian rights. You know, that's why I lost my seat in the front bench, because I advocated for women's rights and lesbian rights in the face of a very aggressive gender identity ideology. And I'll continue to do that, because I think it's the right thing to do. But on the cause and of independence... people on would cause, describe that in a, in a different way, John They may well do, a, but that's what happens. It's a sensitive debate. Now, um, on the cause of independence, Nicola and I are as one. And in fact, many of the issues I've suggested in the party over the years, such as testing this case, supporting <coughs> a people's vote, have gone on okay. and become Alistair party Alistair what did you make of what you heard? I mean, you and Nicola Sturgeon did combat in the uh, independence referendum in 2014. Has she managed to change your mind? Uh, no. The thing that, that I think is, is striking is that, you know, this, is, this argument, certainly from the SP, SNP perspective, is always characterised by the, giving the impression that somehow everybody in Scotland wants another referendum and it's being blocked by the Conservative Party uh, in uh, Westminster. Now, opinion polls are not everything, but the two polls that you showed, I think, are quite instructive. One is, if you look at what's happened since 2014, really... Scotland is split down the middle. Mm -hmm. This country is tearing itself apart. And that uncertainty is damaging to our growth prospects and to our, our, our well-being. The second thing is, it is abundantly clear there is not an, a majority of people in Scotland who want another referendum any time soon. But does point, though? Because if Scottish voters repeatedly, as they have done, choose the SNP as the most popular party, and the SNP has a clear plan to have independence in this country, doesn't she have a point? that actually they're unfairly stuck. Well, look, uh, the, in, in every uh, Scottish election, on general election, uh, I remember being told by the SNP, look, this isn't about independence, we just want to, uh, people to vote for us because, you know, they say they can run the country uh, properly, which is highly debatable, I think. You see, if there really was a surge in support for independence, you would expect to see it reflected in polls. And these polls are conducted just about every week now. Mm -hmm. Certainly but plenty of them. There's, there's no shortage of them. Mm -hmm. But what, what, what I think, what worries me is my argument about in 2014 and my argument today is that I think Scotland is stronger. I don't have no track with the present Tory government. We've got a general election coming up in a couple of years. But the, the idea that Scotland could do everything you want and it will all be lovely uh, with independence is it just isn't true. For example, I understand that the position of the SNP mm. now on currency is they're going to use the pound. This would be the same pound that the Tories have been busy you know, trashing. Well, so well, how is that going, going, going to be, be better? A, a policy paper published next week, well, which will well, flesh well, out that position. And that will come in the next debate. So I'd, like I'd, I'd yeah. like to move on, because we, we will have yeah. a bit more, more time at the end. But Martin, the other massive pressure, of course, from energy and the markets that we're seeing is what's happening with interest rates. I mean, there's a big piece in the Telegraph this morning. I think we can show people about the tensions around that. What on earth is going on between the Bank of England and the government? I mean, you know what it's like to be a Chancellor in a crisis. What is it like? What does it feel like? Well, it's not great, is the answer to that. Um, <laughs> That's my big dramatic question yes. answer. <laughs> um, look, the, the key thing when you're facing a crisis is, amongst, is to be able to work with others who can help you. And one of the things that worries me about what happened in the last um, couple of weeks or so is it appears to me that the government was not talking to the Bank of England. And it looks like the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee was completely blindsided about an announcement. Do you think they were in the dark? I, th I don't think... I, I don't, I, I have not spoken to them, but I do not think they knew what the government was going to do. Now, in every budget announcement uh, and every you know, statement that I made, I would always make sure that the governor of the Bank of England knew what we were doing, and we, we met very regularly. Instead, what you've seen is the government, and they're at it again today, trying to trash the Bank of England, along with having excluded the Office of Budget Responsibility. This is undermining... It's the government's credibility that is being un undermined. And the unfortunate side effect so the direct effect of this is because of what's going on just now, interest rates are going to be higher than they would otherwise be, and of course that feeds directly into the amount of money pe people pay on their mortgages as well as, as prices generally. So I think the relationship between the government of the day and the Bank of England is absolutely critical. What you can't do is trash it and, or just ignore it, 
because they will pay a heavy price from that. And I don't mind if the government's in trouble. I do mind very much what's happening to our country uh, because, you know, our credibility is being damaged, <laughs> what we're having, going to have to pay in the future because of high prices and so on. That and was it's, hugely damaging to our growth prospects. And it's certainly one of the biggest challenges that this government is trying to grapple with. Now, no surprise, the First Minister was only too keen to mention the chaos that has been seen in the Tory party since Liz Truss took over. In the seven days since we spoke to the Prime Minister in Birmingham, it feels like turmoil has become the new norm. And if there's been a quicker or dramatic, more dramatic fall in support, I'm not sure I can remember it.